Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Today we're going to talk about the double jeopardy provision of the Fifth Amendment. So, let's get into that. One of the first things you need to do before you start looking at anything else when you're trying to interpret a provision of the Constitution is to tune out everything that you already know about it and start with the written words of the text because those are the words that a court is going to believe control in this situation. So let's look at the text of the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation." So obviously the part when you're talking about double jeopardy is the part that reads as follows. Nor shall any person be subject to the same of, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be put twice in jeopardy of life or limb. That is the double jeopardy clause. But it has some interesting interpretations that go to it. For a long time, even up through about 19, uh, I guess 1940, the double jeopardy provision did not extend to the states. In other words, you could claim protection under the, for under the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment in a federal trial, but you couldn't claim the Fifth Amendment in a state trial. But that was, for most part, because every state constitution had pretty much the same uh, text in it. It had the same protection against twice being put at risk of uh, conviction for the same offense. So when you look at the text, the key words in this part of the text are the same offense to twice be put in jeopardy. So it has to be the same offense. So one of the questions that has quite naturally arisen as a result of this is, what is the same offense? So, for example, somebody steals a car on Monday and drives it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and gets arrested on Saturday. Do they get charged with separate offenses for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? Well, as the prosecutor pointed out in uh, the Brooks trial, there's no, no protection for being charged. The protection comes at the end. You can't be convicted twice for the same offense. Now, one way that this issue raises its ugly head is in the context of state and federal prosecutions for essentially the same thing. You may remember the Simi Valley incident where uh, the gentleman was beaten by the police officers and the police officer said, hey, we were acquitted in state court. You can't charge us in federal court. The things the state needed to prove to prove that they had been assaulted, that, Mr. that the gentleman had been assaulted and battered were different than the elements that the federal government had to prove for denial of a constitutional right. Let's take a look at what a prosecutor must prove to prove assault. This is from the Legal Match website. You can find this online. In a criminal law context, the term assault generally refers to the criminal act of intentionally placing another individual in reasonable apprehension of imminent bodily harm or offensive contact. contact. Although this definition is subject to change based on the laws of the jurisdiction, hearing the case, the standard case for assault is the defendant must have intended to create a state of apprehension or awareness in the victim. 
The prosecutor must prove the victim reasonably believed they would be harmed or offended by the defendant's conduct, and the victim's belief of impending injury must be both reasonable and one that creates a sense of immediate physical danger, uh, and the defendant must exhibit a present intention to harm or offend the victim through a physical act. So those are the elements that have to be proved, and those are the elements that make up the charge of uh, assault. Now, when someone actually connects with a... Uh, let me give you a good example. If you draw back your hand and you look ugly at somebody and you step in close, that is an act that could potentially place that person in imminent fear of being struck. That is assault. And if you can prove those elements, you have a criminal conviction for assault. When you connect with the punch, that is battery. And battery has different elements. That's why a lot of times assault and battery tend to be separate uh, convictions. So let's look at some of the cases that have interpreted the issue of uh, double jeopardy. So one of the first cases to deal with the um, issue of double jeopardy uh, came up in United States versus Perez, which is a case from 1824. And in United States versus Perez, you had a situation where there was a mistrial. Now, a mistrial can occur for a number of reasons. For example, early on in the case, or a case, a mistrial can occur because something prejudices the defendant's rights. For example, some item of evidence that the court has previously excluded gets mentioned or gets introduced, and that deprives the the defendant of a fair trial. That does not create double jeopardy because the case did not reach a final conclusion. So there's no, no double jeopardy there. So in this case, what happened was they got to the final part where the jury had the case and at the end of the day, the jury was hung. It could not reach a verdict on whether the, the person was guilty or not guilty of the crimes charged. So what happened? Well, the state went to retry them. And when they went to retry them, the defendant objected, he appealed, he took it to the United States Supreme Court. And what the United States Supreme Court said is double jeopardy did not attach to the first trial because there was no final disposition at the end. In other words, he was not acquitted. He simply wasn't convicted. And that was because the jury could not resolve the factual issues that were presented to them. The next case that comes up is a case from 1977 called uh, Brown versus Ohio. And in Brown versus Ohio, this is sort of the issue that I was referring to earlier about uh, someone stealing a car and going joyriding. As you can see here on this syllabus, which uh, comes from uh, findlaw.com or justia.com, uh, the Double Jeopardy Clause of the Fifth Amendment applied to the states through the Fourteenth Amendment held to bar prosecution and punishment for the crime of stealing an automobile following prosecution and punishment for the lesser included offense of operating the same vehicle without the owner's consent. So that the person who stole the car was charged first with operating the vehicle without the owner's consent. That's the joyriding issue. And then because that's a lesser included offense of vehicle theft, the conviction for that barred a subsequent prosecution for stealing the car. That only makes sense because essentially the elements are the same. And indeed, that's what the court says where the same act or transaction constitutes a violation of two distinct statutory provisions, the test to be applied to determine whether there are two offenses or only one is whether each provision requires proof of a fact which the other does not. And in that case, it does. It, they found that it did not. They found that joyriding and car theft were essentially the same thing. So the most recent case that has come about of the double jeopardy is from 2012, and it's Bluford versus Arkansas. And let's look at the actual text of the Supreme Court opinion here. 
The state of Arkansas charged petitioner Alex Bluford with capital murder for the death of a one-year-old child. That charge included the lesser offenses of first-degree murder, manslaughter, and negligent homicide. Before the start of deliberations, the trial court instructed the jury to consider the offenses as follows. If you have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt on the charge of capital murder, you will consider the charge of murder in the first degree. If you have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt of the charge of murder in the first degree, then you will consider the charge of manslaughter. If you have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt of, on the charge of manslaughter, you will then consider the charge of negligent homicide. The court also presented the jury with a set of verdict forms which allowed the jury to either convict Bluford of one of the charged offenses or to acquit him of all of them. Acquitting on some but not on others was not an option. Now, obviously, the reason for that is because of the earlier case we talked about, Brown versus Ohio, where if you get acquitted on a lesser included offense, it means you're not guilty of the more serious offenses. So that's why the Arkansas instructions were created that way. When the jury came back, they had uh, acquitted, they had basically reached a verdict of acquittal on murder and capital murder but they were hung on the manslaughter charge, and they continued to go back to the judge saying, we're hung up on this, we can't reach a verdict on the manslaughter charge. So the judge declared a mistrial, and on retrial, the defendant said, hey, you can't charge me with um, capital murder or murder in the first degree because I was acquitted of those on the first jury. And the court said, no, you were not acquitted because we never accepted the jury's verdict. The jury reached decisions on those, but those were never turned into a verdict. And as a result, yes, you must face them a second time. He took it up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, eh, sorry, dude, that's not the way this works. So double jeopardy requires uh, it to be the same offense. In other words, if you, if the, if the prosecutor decides to charge you with only hitting one person in a fight and you get acquitted of hitting that person in a fight, they can still come back and charge you with hitting someone else in that fight. And the reason they can do that is because the elements are not the same, because the people are not the same. Now, there might still be a double jeopardy argument that it should have been brought in the first case, and that would have to be decided in another court in another point in time. I think under the state constitutions of a lot of more liberal jurisdictions, that wouldn't fly. But we, I don't have a case on point with regard to that. So at any rate, that's how the double jeopardy provision works. So it will be interesting to see if the prosecution... Uh, for example, allows the jury to come back and return a verdict for less than all of the charges here. We'll just have to see what happens. Um, it, will, it will truly be interesting. Anyway, that's my take on uh, Double Jeopardy. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. And um, thank you for watching. I appreciate everybody who has joined the channel. And if you have any questions, I'm always happy, always available by email. If you send me an email, I'll be happy to respond to it. It's in the About section here on YouTube. Thanks again for watching. Have a terrific day.